Namaste. So in this series and many others, we've been talking a lot about Brahman, but we never actually defined Brahman or looked into its etymology or derivation. So let's take a little break from going through the sutras and instead look into the etymology of Brahman. So Brahman, the word, comes from two roots, brh, which means growing, increasing, expanding, sounding in the form of brahmanada, or transcendental sound, dividing, as in classification, discharging, as in emanating the material creation, and speaking or shining, emanating energy and intelligence and giving the actual truth about the creation and life. The second root, the suffix, comes from man. Man is related to the word for mind. So it means considering, also inquiring, knowing, thinking, and realizing. So we can put these roots together and we get Brahman. Now, if you look at the Sanskrit characters, there's two syllables, Bra and Hma. So don't omit the H when pronouncing the word Brahman. It's an important part because it goes right clear back to the root of bra. The word Brahman then means unlimited expansion of consciousness, growth or emanation of consciousness, thinking, feeling, the uh, scheme of the universe, the creation, all these things. And in general, I looked it up in the Sanskrit dictionary. Uh, the word Brahman is considered to mean the ineffable, subtle being that is the origin of everything. And one who knows Brahman, of course, attains liberation. So the kind of knowing that we're talking about here is not intellectual knowing. It's not mental knowledge in the form of symbols, but rather it's a direct perception in the form of consciousness, not ordinary consciousness, consciousness of consciousness, Turiya. So to realize Brahman is to realize the consciousness of consciousness. To realize Brahman is to experience a field for unlimited growth of consciousness. And uh, I think it's instructive to talk about how I got to this realization. That I've been meditating for a long time. And I've gone through quite a few different methods and so on. And I use them interchangeably to enter into higher states of consciousness. What do I mean by higher? Beyond the relative states of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Now, this is called Turiya, the fourth state. And in the fourth state, one is aware of the other three states as the objects of consciousness. In other words, consciousness of consciousness. We're all aware that we are aware. That is the distinguishing uh, quality of human life. We know that we know. We're conscious that we're conscious. This is a really big deal. Although most people kind of just take it as a, a given, as an assumption. Oh yeah, sure, 
I know that I am. Actually, among all the different species of life, only the humans have this psychological or psychic facility. Why is it important? Because it can lead to self-realization. Self-realization means liberation from the round of birth and death. It means the end of suffering. It means coming into contact with the universal ocean of existence, consciousness, and bliss. Satchitananda. It means entering a world where there are no limitations, no breaks, no boundaries, no obstacles. Everybody likes growth. You know, ask any young kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'll say, you know, this or that. But what they really want is to grow up. Nobody wants to be a kid forever. They want to grow up because they see that growth gives them all kinds of privileges and facilities that they don't have as a child, isn't it? So similarly, as an adult, growth in every area is highly esteemed. Financial growth, career growth, self-potential growth, growth in knowledge, in learning, growth in ability, uh, to grow to be the best in the world at something is considered a very desirable goal. Growth in opportunities, growth in power, in influence, in fame, beauty, knowledge, renunciation, or any of the great opulences that drive people. They want to measure their success in life by growth. There's only one problem. <laughs> number one, all this growth is just temporary. And number two, there are so many obstacles on the path to growth. Look at what's happening now in the world as a result of economic growth. Now the whole climate is threatened. The whole ecology is uh, being damaged by human economic activity extraction of fossil fuels, and so on and so forth. So there are always limits to growth. There are always some obstacles that you cannot overcome. So no matter how good you get or how great you become in the material world, there's always a limit to it. And even in the mental world, if you acquire knowledge, there's some limit to that. There's only so much information your brain can hold. And even if you say, well, I'll use computers, <laughs> they're limited too. Computers are pretty stupid, actually. They're literal. They only do what they're told to do. So computers are not a solution to the problem of knowledge because knowledge is only the first step then you have to understand it. And a computer can't understand anything, really. Only humans can do that. Because understanding means modeling. And understanding means being able to predict the outcomes of any particular subject. So a computer can't do that unless it's told by a human how to do it. See? Humans have creative intelligence. Computers don't. They probably never will. So even in that sense, huh, with the age of artificial intelligence and big data and all that, there are still so many problems that we can't solve because of a lack of knowledge. For example, we can't go back in time and determine by observation how the universe was created or how the species developed or so many other questions about geology and nature and time, deep time especially. Well, there, there are speculations about it, 
Huh? But no real answers. The same with astronomy. Astronomers are always theorizing about how this or that strange phenomenon came to be. But they'll never really know because usually they're looking at something that happened millions of years in the past. And they can never really predict what's going to happen and when. So these are all the limitations of human knowledge, human consciousness. How far can our consciousness penetrate? Only as far as our senses or their extensions in the form of different sensors and measuring devices and so on. Still, there's always a limit. There's a limit to the smallness that we can see. There's a limit to the bigness that we can see. Now, uh, we're over 10 minutes, so all the stupid people have left. <laughs> I always save the best until the end, you know? I came to this avenue of realization by thinking over what I have learned or what I have experienced in meditation. And I'll cut right to the chase. I noticed that in all my meditations, they were limited by the range of human intelligence, the range of human consciousness. I said, wait a minute. If consciousness is Brahman and Brahman is unlimited, in meditation, we ought to be able to tap into unlimited consciousness. Our consciousness doesn't have to be restricted to the body, the senses of the mind. It should be open and free and extended. So I started to meditate on this and I came to a huge limitation, a very big barrier that said, no, you cannot go farther than this. So immediately, of course, I had to figure out a way around it. <laughs> That's just my nature. Don't tell me I can't do something. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave out all the details. But basically, I realized that the one thing that I'm missing in my realization of Brahman is this sense of scale this oceanic consciousness, the unlimited nature of consciousness. I was always running into limits. And for a while, I didn't even think of these as limits. I thought that's just the way it is. But no, there's no need for that. The great enlightened souls like Ramana Maharshi and Chandrasekhar and Indra Saraswati, they could see things and know things that they had no possibility of directly sensing. They could read people's minds and stuff like that. I wouldn't want to read people's minds <laughs> because I know what's in there is mostly garbage, if it's anything like my mind. <laughs> but the ability to see through time, for example, or the ability to uh, sense things on a broader scale in general would be very valuable and also very blissful. Why should we stop at the amount of bliss that one person can experience? If Brahman is unlimited existence, consciousness, and bliss, we ought to be able to go way farther than that. So over the last few days, I've been experimenting with this. And the preliminary results are very encouraging. It looks like it is possible once you tune into Brahman by eliminating everything else, then to grow that realization without any limit. And isn't this what we are all looking for? Isn't this the real ocean of bliss? The one that we're all hankering for? And I'm here to tell you, it's within reach. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti. 